This is Show Up as a Leader, a show from People Forward Network, helping you maximize your positive impact on the world by becoming your best, fully authentic self. Hey, everyone. Have you ever had a conversation with a formal leader that you know is just genuine and authentic and models what we wish all leaders were? That's exactly what happened in this conversation I had with Tim Lupinacci. He is the CEO and chair at Baker Donaldson, which is a law firm. And sometimes you don't think about that when you think about courage and authenticity, but he leads over 1,300 individuals in 22 offices. And he is just the epitome of a human authentic leader. And we had such a great conversation with very tactical, practical things they are doing to help connect employees to purpose, to really develop everybody to show up as a leader. And wait till you hear when his self-limiting story gets the best of him. He says he leans on courage, but it's an acronym for how he gets out of his own way. We talk about really being intentional and thoughtful about different aspects that help support people with their mental and emotional well-being, and so much more. I think you're really going to get a ton out of this conversation. Why do you see that everyone is a leader, and how does that show up in the work that you do? It started for me 30 years ago when I was a young lawyer. I had a boss who was a pretty gruff, angry kind of person at times, but I had high expectations, which was good. And I had been assigned to a project with another lawyer who was about five years my senior. We had worked on it. To me, that time of my life, everything was very transactional. I got a project, I did it, I turned it in. In this case, I turned it into the middle lawyer, the lawyer who's five years older, and then he turned it into the boss. We both got summoned to his office and he was in the middle of a long, loud <laughs> conference call with a bunch of lawyers. And we walked in, myself and the other five-year older than me lawyer, and he starts yelling at us and saying that these idiots got this wrong and they're going to fix it, which of course, that's not a good sign of leadership to call somebody an idiot. But anyway, he was very aggravated and we had miscounted some things. He said, we were going to stay there all night and get it done, which we did brief calculate everything, got it sent out. And I had drawn the short straw of driving the boss to court the next morning, which was about an hour and a half drive away. I'm in the car. It's very quiet thinking, am I going to keep my job? I mean, I didn't know what was going on because we'd really messed this up. First thing he did was apologize, which I mean, I didn't ever see him do that before, but he said he shouldn't have been yelling like that in front of a lot of other people. And then he said that the thing that bothered me the most about it as it related to you, Tim, is I really see you as a leader, as someone who can step up and really get stuff done and do it excellently. And I'd never really thought of myself as a leader. You know, like I said, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. I'm doing the project, turn it in and move on. And he said he really wanted me to own the projects. And so that just really led me on this journey of what does it mean to be a leader and how to show up as a leader? And it's literally been a three decade journey now. But now leading an organization, I am a firm believer that everyone in this organization is a leader. And from the first town hall, when I was named as the new CEO of the company, I came out and told everyone, I said, every single one of you is a leader, no matter what area of the firm you work in. You could be a receptionist, a runner. To the most senior partner, you are a leader, regardless of your title. And then I really tried to implement some practical steps to really put some meat behind just calling them that because I needed tools and tips and practices to become a better leader. I wanted to help all my colleagues to understand that and grow. I love that. So let's dig into that because it's one thing to like make a prophetic statement or have this conceptual, but it's another thing to have it lived like regular experience and have deliberate practices. So what are some of the things that you have implemented and put in place to really equip people and support them to show up as a leader, regardless of their title or role? Well, I think early on, because we're about a 1300 person organization and I certainly didn't know everyone and everyone didn't know me. The first part of it was to just show up in each office and just get around the table, bring in some food and listen, empower them to be able to give feedback to me, even though I had this title and everything, but say, what can I do to help you? And that was really just building the relationship. And I thought that was pretty important as a first step to say, like, I'm really genuinely interested in what you have to say. And then I did take action on some of it. Now we can't do everything that everyone has a gripe or a complaint. But there were really good insights. And I'm always trying to think about how can I get better every day? So I'm hearing from folks and challenges they have in their day to day and then reacting on it. But over time, I really got this sense from my colleagues. They really wanted to be able to see like a pathway. Where can I go with my career? 
and really see what is the purpose I serve here to really connect it to the bigger picture of what we're doing and not just trying to drive financial performance. And so we, as a law firm, professional services firm, we represent clients. Some of our clients are literally changing the world and what they do. And everybody here has a small part of that and trying to connect the purpose, first of all, with some stories and seeing how their work really does impact that. But then getting very practical, we have built pathway programs where people have training and improve in their leadership, in communication, in their skill building, and also to see that they have opportunities to move up into other roles that are more attuned to maybe what they want to accomplish. Even down to the practical of one thing we're really working on now is the strategic focus on being trusted advisors to each client. And I created a mini MBA program, like a trusted advisor, mini MBA program. And I know folks who have legitimate MBA program, it's a lot of work and I respect it, but I'm just trying to help our colleagues to see that they can be trusted advisors even internally. So we've built in training around how to become a better trusted advisor. And a lot of it is conflict resolution and trustworthiness. So it's really trying to put some programming around to help everyone feel like they can get better every day and have an impact. I love that so much on multiple levels. And the first thing that strikes me about that is so often when we think about development. So first of all, there's a big difference between training and development that people lump them together, but training is learning skills over and development is really messy. Development requires us to focus on that inner game stuff, shift our thinking mindset. Like development is getting us to a different level and it can go hand in hand with training, but I think they're very different things. And what I love about what you're sharing is so often there might be training for all employees. And usually it comes in the form of required annual compliance training or privacy training, like in a law firm or whatever it might be. And then development is usually reserved for either a select few, let's say a C-suite or a certain level of leadership and above. I think there's got to be a better way of looking at how we invest in people. But that's usually where it's reserved for because people think, well, budget, time. And then you have this whole group of people who are not being invested in and they're falling back on habitual patterned ways of doing things that many times are really a result of this insecure, hijacked 10-year-old version of themselves. And we wonder why we aren't going along with change initiatives. We wonder why people are getting their own way. And so I love that you are investing in everybody. And we talk about this with our clients. You can certainly phase it, but you can't just reserve it for a select few. So how did you go about doing that? Whether you're a 50-person company or 10,000, I mean, you're 1,300, but that's an undertaking. So how did you go about doing that, like to get from idea to where you are now? We actually had a consultant that we were trying to help build out some of the programming and they focused the attention on, we'll really bring together the high performing folks and do this. We launched this vision last year and I'd be a trusted advisor to every client. There's nothing new about that, but I really thought that it could differentiate ourselves. And it was very focused on not only the external client, but internally, we have to build the trust internally as well. And so I just said, we're going to help you do it. We're going to build together a trusted advisor, mini MBA. And then it's like really building it. It was hard to your point because I didn't go to school necessarily for that. I had an idea about some of the defined traits and what we really wanted to do, but we did, we started, we broke it down into pieces and different topics, probably within that whole trust umbrella for the shareholder, the more senior lawyer and the younger lawyer and the paralegal and the business service professional and the staff. So we really tried to divide it out and think about what is the best way to bring training together. And so we did all kinds of different things, including some virtual programming where we had internal leaders and external speakers come in and speak to our people. We did in-person training as well. I think as it relates to our business services and staff, we did in-person training over a couple of days, the kickoff of it last fall, led by other firm leaders so they could see their own colleagues. It was a train the trainer kind of situation, but break out into smaller groups with follow-on work with the business services professionals, we used a book that was all about trusted advisor as follow on times to get together, brought in lunch for people and really then try to launch it. So it was a lot of work. It was a lot of intentionality. And really we did get some external help to try to think about it. We realized we needed somebody to help us with this talent development to your point. And so we hired a director of talent development. We went out and looked in the marketplace for someone who could help us really do it. But to kick it off, we really tried to be intentional practical, actionable steps that people could take in their day to day and become better at what they're doing. It's one thing to have technical expertise. And I think there's incredible value in leveraging internal folks and 
there's a different understanding about adult learning principles and how do adults learn and retain that trained learning and development professionals understand. So I love that you ultimately created that position. What a great thing. Here's the question I have, because I know this comes up from people a lot. So in a professional services firm, you are on billable hours or healthcare, they're on RBUs. And so there is this productivity mindset. So how do you overcome that hesitancy or resistance that might come up about, well, hold on a second. Like if we take people away from servicing our clients, being that trusted advisor, there's this push pull of we can't afford to invest in that because we're so stuck on billable hours. That is the challenge of every professional service firm. And so we've tried to really define what it means, the expectations of what it means to be a part of Baker Donaldson and what we're trying to accomplish with probably a lower billable hour expectation than some firms, but with the expectation that you're going to invest the non-billable time in this development. And some of that time is certainly giving back pro bono, like free legal services. Some of it is investing in community service. We have a whole program around Baker Cares, but it's also about professional development. It's about client development, business development. And so it's a holistic look at what we hope to try to accomplish. And the whole reason being because as you're more focused and doing things that you can see have meaning and purpose, you become a better employee in the billable hours and you're more effective, more efficient. As you're building these relationships internally and with your clients, by spending that non-billable time with them, you're becoming a better trusted advisor. So they're really relying on you. So I think it really works to drive performance and productivity and financial performance, but it's also focused on, we got to take care of ourselves. We all have a finite amount of capability, in my view, of how much we can just put the nose to the grindstone and we're not going to be as effective and efficient in serving each other and our clients. Well, and I think that's such a healthy way of looking at it because we cannot serve our purpose. We can't serve others if our tank is depleted. And I think so many people in various industries that have that kind of productivity focus forget that. And it's this mindset of, In this fast paced world, in a shrinking economy, when various industries are doing layoffs, it's the push people to do more with less is the go to mantra. And that's the exact opposite because the latest stat from Gartner HR is that we literally can absorb about half the amount of change we could in 2019. So our capacity has been cut in half. So, even more reason why we can't do that. So, I want to circle back to something before I build on that. So, when you talked about the kind of the mini MBA of helping people become a trusted advisor. Prior to that, you were talking about connecting them with purpose. And I want to build on that because we know from whether it is Kevin Oaks and the Institute for Corporate Health and Productivity or others that regardless of generation group, this is not just a Gen Z and a millennial thing, that regardless of generation group, people want to be associated with an organization with a strong sense of purpose. And it can't be purpose washing where it's just words on a website. Like if you look at purpose as part of like the ESG movement, looking at the social part and there's metrics behind it. And so it takes deliberate practices and intentionality to go, oh yeah, we have this purpose, but then how do we actually keep it alive and connect people to it? So besides having this mini MBA and trusted advisor, how else are you helping everybody connect to the organization's purpose and kind of see themselves in that bigger picture? Because I think this is where a lot of organizations struggle and get stuck. But then how do we actually live it and connect people on a daily basis? When we talked about like trying to balance productivity and purpose, I mean, we still are business have to keep the lights on, right? It's hard. It's just, I think it's having the mindset and the intentionality to try to really do your best to make it work. This is something I really hadn't thought about that it would impact it, but really coming out with a strategic vision that everyone had a role in and people really are now seeing results by doing a lot of what we've accomplished in year one just seeing where the company's going and that where the organization's going, that is one level of finding like I'm a part of something that's moving. We've had some success on the financial side, but also on impacting communities and people buying into that. I knew we had to get buy-in for a vision, right? To go execute it, just to have people really row in the same direction. That is one level. But then we're trying to be very intentional every time we have virtual town halls or when I go around offices and visit to have stories of successes. I mean, certainly there's some client successes, But we try to have business services and staff professionals who have stepped up and done things, not only maybe for serving a client, but in the community. We try to recognize them and see how they've been able to take their commitment to do this Baker Cares, where we're working with organizations right now that are trying to eradicate homelessness. We have individuals who have partnered with those organizations and have really made some changes in some people's lives to come back and tell the story to the rest of the colleagues. 
I know we had a colleague met at one town hall who was talking about how her struggle in her family previously with some mental health issues. Well, she's a healthcare lawyer now, and she is representing behavioral health systems and how she connects this purpose that was so meaningful to her with her family, with what she's doing and helping clients now serve families like her family and just connecting those dots. It helps people see the purpose. The best stories, I guess, is that somebody really took that idea and led with it is our Baltimore office. We realized that we could consolidate all our people onto two or three floors, leaving a completely empty floor, tried to sublet it, couldn't do that. Well, our managing partner of our Baltimore office was meeting with a friend of hers who was involved in a minority business incubator, startup businesses. There's actually something connected, I think, with Goldman Sachs and a lot of big organizations helping, but they had no place to house these companies that were startups. So they hatched this plan of, well, we would, for a dollar a year, sublease this space to this nonprofit. And so now we have 30 new startup businesses who had been selected in this program that they now have office space that they can have customers to in a nice building in downtown Baltimore. And so like we host monthly meetings with all these new business leaders with our colleagues and we give them tips and training. And every time that they tell that story, it still gives me goosebumps because it's connecting. I mean, it's such a smart thing. We have this space and now we're helping these businesses grow. So all that to say, it's all about just being intentional about trying to connect the dots for people and seeing that we really do mean what we say when we're trying to drive purpose and give back. I love that. What a creative way too. I think there's a lot of organizations that the work has changed. There are some that are now completely remote and they're like, we're going to give up the office space. So I know commercial real estate is struggling a bit. We're going to now have a hybrid model permanently. The pandemic has fundamentally changed how we work for a lot of industries, again, that are the knowledge workers at a computer type of a thing. And so I love that you're looking at how can we support other businesses and how can we really give back? I think that that's fabulous versus just sitting on this space and all we're just going to wait till the lease comes due. I think this is going to feed into the next question I want to ask you. So when you talked about the lawyer that had mental health struggles and her family and whatnot, this is a hot topic right now. And let's be honest, mental health has been struggling in this country for a long time, but it's a boiling point. And one of the latest stats that the American Psychological Association put out, which makes complete sense, is that 87% of adults believe that there has been a constant stream of crises since 2020 without a break. And it's taking its toll. And so I always say, like when I'm doing keynote speeches and stuff, this is not about politics. If you look at everything that's going on in our world, mass shooting after another and a killing here and violence here and whatever, it's just nonstop. And people are struggling and workplaces are struggling to look at how do we help this? And so having a good employee assistance program is fine, but that by itself is a Band-Aid. Putting in extra mental health resources or resiliency programs, again, putting it back on the individual is a piece, but it's a Band-Aid. And so when I think about the organization's role, and we know that purpose actually has a protective factor. So I love that you're doing that because employees with a strong sense of purpose report less burnout, report less stress. That's one thing an organization can do that can help with the mental health. But how else are you doing this? Because let's be honest, if we just want to be stereotypical, law firms are not usually considered like the most warm and fuzzy. So you are really being intentional on an organizational level about mental health and wellness. Say more about what you're doing, because I think that people can learn from you. I think even some of the Band-Aids are helpful for those of you who are doing that. I mean, EAP programs, we have an app that we have now done. I think it's called Ginger App, where you can actually get real-time chat with a consultant, like if you're on a plane and you're about to take off and you're a little bit frantic and you need somebody. So we have some good tools But again, I think to me, it's been about intentionality and it's been leading from the top. I've been very honest. I've used in a prior firm EAP program, and it was very helpful for me at that point in time. So I talk about that. And then during the pandemic, I just needed a safe space of somebody to talk with. And so I have a psychologist that I talk to every month or two. It was probably every couple of weeks during the heat of the pandemic and just get on a video and talk and sometimes jokes that I'm one of his easiest patients because I'm just a type A. And he says, I just need to keep you around the edges, keep you focused and not get to make some space for yourself. But it's all important. I try to lead from saying, I need this. I'm struggling with the constant crisis. We did that during the pandemic. She's done a series of additional videos for us that we roll out regularly. We have opened up 
opportunities because we have built this connection with this one individual who's been really great to work with the last several years. Our colleagues have access to 60 minutes of time with her. It could be two 30 minutes or one 60 minutes that the firm would pay for. And then they could build other relationship if they want to do that. But just trying to bring it down about being intentional about talking about it. We've had colleagues come and share at town halls about struggles they've had with various mental health wellness issues, including bringing some people in the legal industry from outside the firm. Because as you said, that's the perception of law firms. It's too touchy-feely to talk about it. But the legal profession also is higher on the percentages of folks struggling with mental health wellness issues and alcohol addiction and other things. So it's a very real thing. And we have to be intentional about trying to lead and just talking about it. So those are some things we've done, but I always feel like there's got to be more to be done, right? Because we got to take care of the whole person, I think, because that's how we're going to better show up for our clients and for each other. Absolutely. Having access to those resources is important. But what I love that you're doing when I say like, it's a bandaid, if you just hear we do that, but we don't change how we do business, we do that, but we're not going to be vulnerable. So if you just put those resources in, it's like, there's still a stigma attached. And so what I love is, first of all, is the CEO, you're modeling it, like you're creating that courageous environment to say, hey, I struggle with this too, and that you're bringing it forward. So, you know, admit they make mistakes, but also say that they're struggling. And so I love that you're creating an environment where it's safe for people to say that, because let's be honest, one of the things, I mean, you look at law firms, I know in healthcare, besides like high levels of substance abuse and stress and whatnot, there's also high levels of suicide. And so often when people are struggling, regardless of industry, with mental health challenges and emotional well-being challenges, it's when we feel alone or disconnected, or it's just us or that loneliness factor. And so what I love about what you're doing is normalizing that messiness and saying, hey, I struggle too. There's nothing wrong with you if you're struggling. There's nothing wrong with you to get help. And by the way, we're proactively supporting. So I think like that's something very tangible that organizations can do. Of, do you have the EAP or have those mental health resources, which a lot do, but there's still a stigma because your leaders aren't going to acknowledge it, or there's not going to be an open discussion about, hey, I'm challenged because we're like, well, that's people's private business. I mean, there's a way to do it if people are voluntarily like, hey, I want to share if this helps other people. The other thing that I think you're doing is to go back to, you need to have the resources to help the individuals, but going back to if it's a band-aid, if the organization isn't supporting it, like what are the systems you have in place that make it not feel discongruent? And what I love that you're doing is, again, I'm going to go back to the work you're doing to connect people to purpose because purpose has a protective factor. When you go back to like lower billable hours, so manageable workloads, all of those things contribute to this sense of being supported in our mental health and emotional well-being. So I just want to say kudos because all of those things you're doing, you say we could be doing more, but all of those things make a difference because if you give someone access to extra mental health or EAP, but your work expectations and productivity are unattainable, there's a disconnect. I'm just trying to think because organizations, you know, all trying to get better at this. Something that we've done too, because you're right about the feeling alone, we've had folks come in and help train our leaders about what does it mean to try to lead and trying to identify people struggling and challenging with mental health wellness issues in the more remote environment with some tips there. And also we didn't learn in law school how to identify and how to help others with mental health wellness challenges. Some people have been through it themselves and so that maybe they're more tuned to it. So we've tried to help equip our leaders to better be able to be aware and what to do in those type of situations. And it's all those little things I think companies doing can help too. So that's just a couple of things that you'd mentioned I thought might help some folks. I love that. So you talked about kind of having your own struggles and you're fairly open with it. So what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned from the setbacks that you've had as a leader? I think one thing, if somebody decides they're going to leave the firm and go to another firm, I like internalize it and say like, what did I do wrong? And I rehash the conversations I have with people and how did I make that mistake? How do we do it? Some of the biggest things I've learned is to listen to other feedback and all that before making decisions. But then when I make a mistake, one of the biggest things I've learned through trial and error is just to admit it. I may make a mistake that people believe is a mistake that is the best thing for the organization. I mean, I've got to keep moving forward with that. It's just to admit it and say, look, I apologize. We're backing off of that. We're going to restudy it and look, and maybe there's a different way to do it. So one of that is just being open to criticism and reacting to it, just to be supportive of individuals who may discern that this is not the right platform, that they don't like where we're heading. They're going to go to another firm unless I've made a mistake somewhere, and then I want to apologize. So those are a couple of things that I've done. Realizing that I can't do it all, that's another thing that is really hard for a lot of individuals. 
I have to make sure that I've got the best people around me that could execute in areas where I'm weak. I love ideation and going and conquering big mountains and visions. But then once I get started on that, I'm ready for the next one. And there's a little joke that some of my executive team have is that I've never met an initiative I don't like because I just am thinking ideas all the time because I'm very curious and all that. But you got to execute, right? We have a chief of staff. Her superpower is execution and getting things across the finish line. So just recognizing that I can't do it all and have others and delegate to others who are the professionals in that area. At one time, this was more for me as much as it was a symbolic to others around the firm, but we have business professionals that have to lead us and they're experts in what they're doing. And symbolically, I got some batons made up and said, I'm passing you the baton, Baker Vision 2028. I called our business services professionals and handed it to them and saying, I'm giving them the power and authority to go do it. Now they've got expectations and all of that, that they've got to answer about and have accountability but we need to trust them. Well, it was as much a symbol to me saying, okay, I'm not the best person to lead this and I'm giving you the baton. So anyway, those are just some things that I've tried to get better at from mistakes. What I appreciate about what you're sharing, at least what I'm taking away from it, is you are really modeling the vulnerability that so often is lacking, particularly not just for CEOs, but for so many leaders and so many professions where like, I have to act like I have it all together and I have to have the answers. But what I've experienced, and I would love to know what reaction you've gotten, but when leaders are willing to say, hey, I made a mistake and I'm going to own it. First of all, that's one of the key high trust behaviors. And that when we show up as authentically human, it actually increases our trust, increases connection, increases our credibility, where those inner self-doubting voices will try to tell us, hide your flaws. What has been your experience with being more open? It's one of those things at first, I didn't think about that. That was a really dumb idea to do that. And you get this barrage of feedback and then you say, okay, okay, we hear you. But then later that people say, when you did that, I knew you were going to be a leader I could follow. I didn't think about it in those terms because you listened, it was the wrong move and you learned and you're doing something. And so it builds that trust and it's got to be authentic and genuine. You can't make it up. I think it is. It's about being vulnerable. It's about trying to get better, trying to help your organization get better. So I totally agree. Because let's be honest, most people have a pretty good BS meter anyway. Yeah, you don't want to be around those people. And uh, if you're just trying to generally do the right thing, I think people see that. For sure. So one of the things as you were sharing where you've had some lessons learned or missteps that I want to circle back to and expand upon, one of the things that I've learned in my life experiences and the work that we do with leaders and teams is that there's a normalness of being human where we all, regardless of how much work we've done in ourselves, regardless of what our childhood has been like, we all have these stories that we tell ourselves that are self-protective in nature, but they're very self-limiting and they keep us small. And so what I would love for you to share, Tim, is what is a self-limiting story that you still tell yourself sometimes and when it shows up, how do you move beyond it so that you can still show up as a leader in your life? Great question. I completely agree. You know, it's interesting. We just had a shareholder retreat a few weeks ago. An author, John Acuff, spoke, and he's got a new book out or it came out last year called Soundtracks, which is all about that very thing about we have these soundtracks in our head. So one of the things that I still struggle with is sort of that imposter syndrome. Like people are going to figure out, I really don't know what I'm doing, even though we're building some success. And so that'll still pop up. So one of the things that helped me is, first of all, to realize that I'm doing it and then say, no, no, that's not true. And then also I like to come up with some mantras that help me, you know, I just think about them like every morning. And so I do have a mantra around the word courage. And I really built it during the pandemic because I was trying to help me every day, just I needed to show up. But I really use it particularly in those times when I'm having that voice that's telling me you really don't know what you're doing is courage. And the acronym of, you know, confidence, just having confidence. I'm in this role and I know what I'm doing to be out front. That's one thing I think as a leader and particularly during COVID, we were on the front line all the time, but that's part of the role. I had to be out front on point there. I have to be unshakable in times of struggles. I have to be resilient. Even when I'm doubting myself, just be resilient, learn and move forward. Adaptable. It's another thing that I think I really have struggled with. And so I need to be adaptable. I need to have a growth mindset, not just get fixed and get in my own cocoon. And then the E is encouragement. I have to encourage others because as I encourage others, I think it just helps me. So you got to figure out what works for you. But that voice of self-doubt and a lack of self-confidence, then I say, I got to be a courageous leader. You've operationalized what courageous means for you. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. 
All right. Are you ready for quick questions? I am. Sure. Okay. Fill in the blank. Living authentically is. We're talking about showing up as your true, genuine, authentic self. I mean, even with your unique quirks, I've got a lot of quirks. I love Disney World. I love live music. Just being your authentic self and being curious. I think that's how I try to live authentically. I love that. We all have quirks. Let's be honest. When the world is presenting an opening, but you don't feel like showing up as a leader, what do you do? Well, one of it's a little bit silly, but there's a movie back in the late 70s, all that jazz about Bob Fosse's life and Roy Scheider, who was doing this because he was living a pretty hard life playing the lead actor. But in the morning, he would put in Visine and splash water on his face. And then he'd look in the mirror and go, it's showtime, folks. A lot of mornings, I just, when I don't feel like it, I get up and I just go, it's showtime, folks. It just gets me going. That's something that I do. And I also come back to that courage acronym sometimes too. I love that. <laughs> okay. What is something people would be surprised to know about you? I lived in Guadalajara, Mexico growing up, but some people know that. I guess one thing that a lot of people don't know is that any art form can really literally move me to tears, whether, you know, a well-written book or a movie or a Broadway show or a song. I just love art. All right. What's your favorite go-to movie? This is another little quirky movie that many people probably don't know, but Benny and June is a early Johnny Depp movie. And it also involves the character that has some mental health issues. And since our family has worked with some special needs kids for a while with their organization, that just resonates. And it's just a fun little quirky movie. I love that. I haven't seen that in forever. Now it makes me want to go see it again. All right. You said you love music. What's your go-to song? It's hard to pick one. Basically all things Prince, but let's go crazy. I like just putting that on and. I'm a Minnesota girl. Prince is our hometown boy. So I love that. I love that. What is something you can't live without? Certainly my wife and daughter, 24-year-old daughter is getting married next February. We're excited. That's the clear thing. But also running and being outside is what fills up my bucket. I need to be just outside. I'm not a fast runner, but just I need that me time. Nice. What is something in your ordinary daily life that makes your heart happy? I love reading. I love art. I love being with friends. That makes me happy. That's awesome. And what are you grateful for right now? Well, I'm grateful for the fiance who really treats my daughter well, but I'm really grateful for just being able to be a part of this organization. I didn't have like a lifelong ambition to be CEO of a company to lead like this, but I'm just really grateful for our people and watching them thrive and seeing what they do is really inspiring to me. All right. Last question, Tim. If you could challenge leaders everywhere to practice this one behavior, that would create more human workplaces and equip everyone to show up as a leader, what would that be? Be authentic and be vulnerable and be curious. I mean, I guess just try to learn and get better. I know I just do four things in there, but I think it all just builds on itself, right? I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. To learn more, head over to peopleforwardnetwork.com and of course, hit that follow button.